Luke 11 this morning. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Luke 11. What I'm going to do, as I, as I do often, is I'm going to get you to go to Luke 11. I'm going to get you to go ahead and put a bookmark, put your thumb there. Uh, I don't know, take a screenshot, whatever, whatever you do these days to bookmark something. And also grab Matthew 18. We're going to spend a bit of time in Matthew 18 today as we continue our series in the Lord's Prayer, in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples as a model for praying and petitioning God. As we've said now, this is probably getting repetitious to the point of ad nauseum, but this is certainly not something that Jesus gave, whereby he wants Christians to be vainly just repeating this prayer in order to garnish good luck or to, to get some kind of positive karma in their life. But Jesus gives this as a model of prayer in such that every time you go to God uh, to appeal to Him, to, to commune with Him, and to petition Him, this is how Jesus would, 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 would govern and would guide us to, to speak to God. So it's not a problem, it's not a sin to, to pray this prayer word for word as it's given us in the Scripture, but that's really not why Jesus has given it. He wants you to meditate on each clause, each petition, and call upon God. We're looking at verse 4 this morning. As we go down now, we're toward the very end of how Luke gives us in Luke chapter 11. Let's read it from verse 1. And when we hit verse 4, I'm going to emphasize that as our, as our portion for today. Verse 1 says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And here it is, verse 4, our, our point for today. And forgive us our sins, for we are, ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. We're going to deal with this clause here. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us or everyone who has sinned against us. Some of the older translations, and particularly if you're following Matthew's version of this particular prayer, you'll know that the, the word substituted there is trespasses. Forgive us our, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When we look at this prayer and we look at the way Jesus calls us to petition God, we realize that each and every one of us is in desperate need of a God who is merciful and who is uh, so inclined to forgive us. So this will be our text. We're going to look at Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to give you a few preliminary thoughts before we jump over to Matthew 18, but let's Let's do some groundwork real quick. Go ahead and flip over Matthew 18. We're going to be there in just a moment. But let me give you a few, uh, a few phrases that I, I do trust will hit home. They'll find a place in your heart and they'll do some work on you. First and foremost, this is just a reality. Let me give you this as, as a reality. Sin is infinitely worse than we have ever imagined. Sin is infinitely worse than we have ever imagined. Imagine the most common, the most common word in the Koine Greek, the, the original language of the New Testament, the most common word for sin is that Greek word hamartia, the, the, the word which usually in, in, in common usage in the day was, was more like an archery term. It was a shooting term. And it was a term which often meant when you, you go ahead and draw the bow and take a shot at the bullseye and you missed, and, and I don't know if there's any uh, pro archers here, but my ling lingo is going to be way off here. But anyway, the, the arrow just flies off and you kind of fully shank the shot. That's more probably not an archery term. But go ahead and the arrow flies away. And there was a word they used for that, and it was hamartia. You, you've missed the mark. You've, you've missed the goal. You've missed the objective. This is most often the, the Koine Greek word for sin in the New Testament. And we find that the Paul draws this analogy in Romans 3 where he says there is none good. None good but God. No one does righteously. No one honors God. For all have gone astray. All have gone away. All have missed the mark. God is a holy God. God is a just God. God is infinite in His perfection. And God's law perfectly represents who He is. And we know God's law. We know the commandments. We, we all realize that not only do we know the commandments, but each and every one of us have failed have failed to keep them. We've all missed the mark. We've all failed to honor God, and we've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all failed. And yet sin, as I said earlier, sin is infinitely worse than we've ever imagined. In fact, everyone, everyone, everyone but God has small thoughts of sin. Everyone but God. 
As we've looked at this before, we're not going to labor this this morning because we're in quite a hurry to get to Matthew 18, but we've looked at this before and we've, we've stressed this fact that, that sin in and of itself is a, is a heinous thing, it's a, it's a wicked thing, but what compiles and, 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 and what exaggerates the issue is, is always who is sinned against. You've heard me use this illustration usually at our, our midweek studies when we talked about the reality of sin, the infinite dread of the wrath of God, and the eternality of the punishment of hell. And sometimes people, sometimes people react to that and they, they, they react feeling like maybe there's something unjust about that. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's unjust for God to issue an eternal penalty for sins that are committed in temporal time and, and, and space. And the way we think about this and the way we reason this is we appeal to what's called natural justice. We, we understand that a transgression or, or, or a sin or a crime that's committed against someone is in and of itself bad, it's immoral, it's unethical. But more than that, taking into account is always the one of whom the sin is committed against. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say today I go over uh, my family, you know, there's a family dinner, I go over my brother or my mum's house or whatever, we're having a dinner and, uh, and my brother says something that offends me and, uh, and for some reason I lose all my sanctification, I, I draw back about 20 years and, and I just sock him right in the cheekbone, just, just smash my brother right in the face. That's, that's not that unusual in our family, we tend to, we tend to get down and, 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 and wrestle quite often and, and so let's say I hit him, I, I, I wonder to you if, if anyone here would dispute the fact that that, that is assault, that's, that's actually illegal to, to strike someone. But I wonder what the penalty might be. You could probably imagine it. He'd probably turn and, and, and throw one of his own and, and that would be the end of it. But I wonder what would happen if we change the scenario and again, the action is exactly the same. Cock my fist, strike someone in the face. But this time, I'm walking along the street, complete stranger, in uniform, police officer, and I strike him on the cheek. What has changed? Well, firstly, the act hasn't changed. My physical action is exactly the same, but you all know and I know that the ramifications is going to be much, much worse. Let's, let's exaggerate the situation. Let's take the analogy to its extreme and, and ask this question. Let's say, let's say for example's sake, that, that there's, a, there's a tour of Australia of our Queen Elizabeth II, and here she is, come to visit the, the land down under, the Commonwealth of our nation, and she's our Queen, and here she is, whether you're Republican or not, doesn't matter, here's the Queen, and I break through the crowd, break through security, and I strike her in the face. Never do that, right? People are like, whoa, you know, <laughs> now you gasp. Um, what would be the penalty? You can already see that although the act is exactly the same in all three scenarios, in that what I physically do is precisely the same, the penalty is going to increase drastically each time I commit this act. Not because what I do is different, but because of whom the crime is committed against. Assaulting a sibling is not always the best thing to do, but I'm probably not going to go to prison. But I will if I strike a police officer and if I'm, if I'm so corrupt and defiled as a human being and want to go ahead and strike our queen and I would never do that just to be clear but let's say that for example in a hypothetical sense that that's what I do, the penalty is infinitely worse than the first scenario. The only thing that's changed is the one of whom is sinned against. And so when we think about the infinite holiness of God, the immeasurable, eternal glory of God's perfection. One seemingly minute sin of yours or mine is infinite in its depravity because of who has been sinned against. None other than the infinite cosmic majesty of a holy God. Every single sin, every single sin that's ever been committed, ever will be held accountable. For God is sovereign over all. There is not one square centimeter of all of existence of whom God is not sovereign over and rules and reigns in His glorious sovereignty. Every single sin is infinite in depravity because of the infinite nature of the one who is offended. So let me say what I said a moment ago. Everyone, everyone except God Himself has small thoughts of sin. Only God truly knows the depth of the depravity of every single sin. And so let's not arrive at Luke 11 verse 4 where Jesus encourages us to pray, Father forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. Let's not arrive at that clause and have small thoughts. 
pithy religious traditional thoughts about, well, I grew up in a Christian school or a Christian home and, well, I get it, God forgive me, I had a pretty rotten day, forgive me, and I sleep soundly for the rest of the night. Let us not have small thoughts of sin because God doesn't. God does not. And so when we look at this petition, the first thing that ought to cause us to be profoundly overwhelmed is that we even are given permission to ask. We've been given permission to ask. How often is it taken for granted in our world, maybe in our church, maybe in our lives, in our homes, in in our thinking, how often do we take this for granted that Jesus Christ has given us the privilege to approach God as Father and ask Him to forgive us? And if we truly knew the depth of the depravity, the heinousness, the wickedness, the, 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 the absolute, the, the vileness of every single sin, we would be overwhelmed with the reality that when Jesus said to his disciples, when Jesus says to us from the record here in Luke 11, ask your father to forgive you, we would be absolutely floored by, by that petition. We need to go to, we need to go to Matthew 18, as I, as I mentioned, and, and have a look at what we find here. You know, one of the greatest curses to being a sinner, one of the greatest curses and, and the greatest part of that illness, that, that disease that is sin which so tightly clings to us all and is inside and outside and, and to seem sometimes to possess us entirely, one of the greatest curses of that is that when we are sinners, we don't really know how bad sin is because we're sinners. We don't realize the depth of our depravity. And this is probably one of the hardest things in the world to cause people to, to realize and to, to understand. If you could, if you could make a, an entire generation immediately acutely aware of how guilty they are before God, then preaching the gospel would be the easiest thing in the world. People would come screaming for, for a message of truth, a message of hope, a, a message of good news of forgiveness. It's one of the hardest things in the world to take someone, anyone, any old average Joe, and sit down and say, do, do you realize your debt before an almighty, holy God? Very few, if any, ever do. Let me fulfill my promise to you and move over to Matthew 18, verse 21. It's one of those great stories where Peter, Peter the Apostle makes an absolute fool of himself. I know you love those stories, so here we go. Maybe you don't. I do. Anyway, it's just me. Matthew 18, verse 21, Then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him as many as seven times? Let me give you some context here. There was basically a law, a a rabbinic tradition, something which had been handed down by by the Jewish leaders for generations, part of that tradition which had been so almost deified that it was almost canonized in, in Jewish tradition that you had an obligation to your brother. Now, be careful to note the word brother, right? They're not talking about Samaritans. They're not talking about Gentiles. They're not talking about Romans. They're not talking about barbarians. They're talking about their brother. They're talking about in-house. They're talking about their own ethnicity, those who are among the Jewish people. And, and they had this tradition which said that you have an obligation toward your brother to forgive him up to, get this, brace yourself for this, forgive your brother up to three times. It's intense. After the third time you're completely free of any obligation at all. Completely free. It's like, you know what, dude? You're going to do that again? I, don't even, I have no obligation toward you to forgive you. I can hate you for the rest of my life, and I'm pretty much exonerated by the Jewish tradition, the rabbinic tradition, to, to go ahead and do that. After three times, you no longer had to forgive anyone anything for the offense that they were committing. So here's Peter. He runs up to Jesus. I know it says comes up, but give me some poetic license. He runs up to Jesus, and he's pretty excited. Yeah. He's pretty excited because he's going to make an attempt, and he's made a few, and they've all failed. He's fell flat on his face every time, but he's going to make another attempt to try and impress Jesus. Up he comes. He's pumped. He's excited. He's raring to go. Jesus, he says, in front of everybody, right? He wants everyone to hear this. How often should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And he's expecting Jesus to go, wow, you know, I would have just uh, probably kept the rabbinic. I would have said three. I would have said three. How about you, Peter, you you model of of perfect empathy and sympathy and mercy? You're the example that we all ought to follow. Seven times, Peter, are you... I wonder how Peter came up with that number. He sat there and thought to himself, I'm going to double it. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna double it plus one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wow everybody. And, and maybe the crowd was wow. Maybe when Peter announced this, people in the crowd are like, don't you dare. Don't you dare say that. I've got someone I'm thinking of right now that has sinned against me four times and I am not, I am not forgiving that person. People in the crowd would have been pretty upset at Peter. Shut your mouth, Peter. Right? We, we feel pretty good right now and here you start coming out with your seven times stuff. So Peter feels like he's, he's going to go ahead and really earn some brandy points with the boss. As many as seven times, verse 21. Verse 22 starts like this. Jesus said to him, I did not say to you seven times. I... Before we go on, Peter thought, well, of course you don't. That's, that's me. You're going to say three. And then Jesus continues, I did not say, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In fact, some, some manuscript evidence and some translations have 70 times seven. But whatever the point is, the numeric value is immaterial here. The point is that forgiveness is something for which we ought always to be pouring out because we ourselves have been so forgiven. Now, to explain the point, Jesus goes ahead and tells a parable. 77 times. Can you, imagine, can you imagine what the people sitting there would have thought at that point? 77 times or 70 times 70? Are you serious, Jesus? Do you know what that means? Do you know what these people have done to me? Do you know how I've been abused and I've been written off and I've, I've been backstabbed and I've been criticized and accused and all these? Do you know the mess of my life, Jesus? So Jesus goes on and says, Therefore, verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king, a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I was saying to my wife this morning as we drove here to church, I was saying, I I had always, I knew this parable, you know this parable, but I'd never actually looked this up. I'd always been like, yeah, a lot of money. I owed him a lot. That's the point of the story. He owes a lot of money. So when I began to do some research some months ago now preparing for this, and I began to realize that I had completely, I was totally underwhelmed. In fact, let me give this to you. 10,000 talents in today's money, in Australian dollars, equals $10 billion. $10 billion. $6 billion US. That's what that equals. $10 billion Australian dollars. If you'd have come to me and said, oh, you know, this guy owes hundreds of thousands of it, yeah, that's the point of the story. Ten bi- this, is, this is the budget for the Roman Empire, right? Just get a feel for that, right? This is, this is the parable. He owes this king $10 billion. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Now, it's not saying that this guy was worth that money, but this was actually part of the, the legal system of the day that if you couldn't pay your debt, you and your wife and children could be sold into slavery. That money could be given to the one who you owe the money as a, as, as a credit to kind of cover the bases. He would declare the debt bad and, and write it off and you would be forever in indentured slavery. That was also part of the penalty. So the servant fell on his knees. You know the parable well. He implores the king, have patience with me and I, I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master, the king of the servant, released him and forgave him the debt. Gone. Wiped clean. Ten billion dollars wiped clean. It's utterly unfathomable to you and me today what ten billion dollars is really like. It's utterly unfathomable to people in this day what $10 billion would have been like. And out of compassion, out of pity, the king says, your debt is wiped clean. When that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe me. Now, hundred you, you heard a change in the currency now, 100 denarii. That's a couple of months' wage. That's a few months of income. It's not an insignificant amount. It's not a dollar or two. But comparable to $10 billion, it is completely I- irrelevant. And this servant, this servant has this moment with the king where he owes him $10 billion. He, uh, That's what he owes him. His debt is completely forgiven. 
He goes out, he goes out of the presence of the king. This is the corruption of his heart. He goes outside of the presence of the king where he should be screaming, woohooing, dancing, shout, ten billion dollars forgiven is ten billion dollars earned, and this guy finds someone who owes him money and starts to choke the life out of him. This is crazy. Isn't this isn't this crazy? This is this is real parable here. Like this could this could never really happen, right? Starts choking this guy. You owe me a few months' wage. If, if, if you paid me, if you paid me what you owed me, I would have had something to show that king. And here's me in front of him, bawling, weeping, screaming, whining, and begging to be, to be forgiven. And I wouldn't have had to do that if you'd paid me. I could have given him something. Here's a deposit. Give me some time. I'll, I'll make the 10 billion somehow. And he starts to blame this guy, choking him. Pay what you owe. This is an incredible, incredible story. It has to be untrue. It has to be a parable, right? This, this could never happen. Pay what you owe. Verse 29, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I'll pay you. There's meant to be an allergy there. It's the same scenario, but now the roles are reversed, the tables are turned, and the one who was begging earlier in the day is now being begged unto, have patience, have patience with me. But he refuses, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him, the king, come, come. Summons him to his presence and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And Jesus gives the the capstone, he gives the point, he, he drives the nail in, he says, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Will do to every one of you. Think about the prayer. Remember the prayer, Father, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. So Jesus gives the parable. It's a story. It's make-believe. It's, it's meant to come across as, as fantasy because you could, never, you could never actually believe that this scenario would take place. Someone would, in fact, be in debt $10 billion. However you get into that kind of debt, I don't even know. It's irrelevant to the story. But this guy made some pretty bad life choices. And here he is in debt $10 billion, and he is forgiven in a moment of the entire debt. It would have been merciful. It would have been infinite grace for the king to say, I'll give you one more year. The king was bound under no circumstances to give that person any patience or credence or mercy. And yet he could have said, I'll give you two years. I'll, I'll give you ten more years. In fact, what I'll do is I'll sell half your children. Right? And, and we would have been reading the story thinking, well, I, it's not even fair. It's mercy. Because of the distance between what he deserved to receive and, and what in fact he receives, which is the entire debt is completely annulled and he is liberated from it forever. And as we shared and we saw in the story, he could not, he could not find it in his heart to forgive the one who owed him an irre irrelevant sum in comparison. This is why Jesus encourages this. This is why Jesus encourages this. Pray for forgiveness. You have a right. You have an obligation. You, you have the privilege to, to enter into God's presence, who is the matchless king, the king of kings, to come before him, and your debt is infinitely more than $10 billion. That's why Jesus picks such an insurmountable sum. There was no one in that day with that kind of money. And our debt before God is infinitely more than that. I, I want you to choke on that. I want you to think about what it might feel like if, you, if all of a sudden tomorrow you wake up and there's a, there's a voicemail message on your phone. It's, it, it's the local bank and you shop and they say, look, you don't know this, but you're actually in debt $10 billion. What kind of a bad day that would cause you? Right? <laughs> 
And you're like, I don't, I, I've, never, I've never even seen this bank before. I don't know what you're talking about. And they produce all the paperwork. A judge signed paperwork says you owe this money. Pay it back or you go to prison. That would ruin your week. Maybe your month. Be pretty depressing, right? And if only, if only through the announcement of the gospel, through the reality of the law and the commandments of God, people could feel the weight, they could choke on this reality that our debt before God is infinitely greater than $10 billion. And we owe it, and we will pay every last cent. Every single person on planet Earth that's ever committed a sin owes God infinite recompense and eternal payment of judgment for every single sin committed. And I don't know about you today, but I've got a few. I've got a few sins. I've, I've got a few sins just this week. I've, I've got a few sins probably just today. That's my life. That's my world. That's my burden. That's my, that's my war. And, and, and I'm sure it's exactly the same for you. We are sinners, and by our sin, we are in infinite debt before an infinitely holy God. And Jesus says in this prayer, come, call him Father, and ask him to forgive you. But in asking him to forgive you, remember to forgive others. Remember, remember how we were going through this parable and I, I kept stopping and saying, this is fantasy, remember? This is fantasy. Remember I kept saying that and you kept thinking to yourself, why, is he, why does he keep saying that? This, this would never happen. You imagine a guy that got forgiven $10 billion of debt. He finds someone that owes him a few months wages. He's going to say, you know what? Not only that, here's some money. You're doing it tough, obviously. You've got debts. Here's some money. I've just been forgiven $10 billion. This had, this had never happened. But the reality is this happens every single day in church, in churches, in Christian lives. Every single time that somebody comes before God and says, Lord, forgive me, I, I've sinned, I've failed you, I've broken your commandments, Lord, I, I plead with you to forgive me, and, and, and we know the promise of Scripture is sure, that God is a loving, a merciful, a forgiving God because of Jesus Christ, and then that person goes out of that place of prayer and holds a grudge, holds a burden, maintains their bitterness and unforgiveness toward others. They have done exactly what that servant did harboring unforgiveness in our heart. And you know, you know what kind of, when I talk like this, the, 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 the reaction I always get, I always get the same reaction. Well, Craig, you, just, you don't really know what they did to me. Now, I don't wanna, I'm not trying to minimize anyone's pain or your trauma, or, or I'm not trying to minimize anything about your past or, or how people have hurt you and burnt you and abused you. I'm not trying to minimize any of that. I'm sure it's horrific. But it is nothing compared to what we do to God when we sin. Nothing. It is a debt of a few months' wage is comparable to $10 billion. But you remember, as we opened up this talk this morning, I said everyone has small thoughts of sin. And that's the plague of this generation. That's the plague of the ages. That's the plague of sin on humanity, is we think small things about sin. We consider it to be the greatest injustice, the, the greatest tragedy when someone abuses us, but we can go ahead and lie, steal, defraud, cheat, be envious, lust. We can do all these things to God and no one stops and says, what abuse. And every single one of those sins, every breaking of God's commandment is infinitely worse than $10 billion of debt. This parable is a story, it's just a narrative, it, it is exactly that, it's a parable, it's fantasy, and it happens every day in Christianity. People pray this prayer, don't get me wrong, people do pray, God, forgive me, and then they, they almost always, almost automatically follow on as we forgive those who sinned against us, right? But where's the introspection, where's that moment to say, Father, I've, I've been sinned against, and have I really forgiven? Have I, have I released people from that debt? Have I, have I released them? Look at, look at how this king forgives the servant. He doesn't say, right, I forgive your tidiness. I, I forgive your inability to pay it back. Let's make out a little payment plan and work this out. Let's say you owe me one billion, not ten billion. Let's, let's do that. That's not the forgiveness that God issues. The forgiveness that God issues is completely wiping out the record of debt. 
Paul says that God takes that record of our debt before God and nails it to the cross. So not only, do, not only do we fail all the time to forgive those who sinned against us, but we fail to forgive them in the same way that God forgives us. I'll forgive him if he comes back and pays me back. I'll forgive him if he goes public and says that what he said about me is not right. I'll forgive him if he makes recompense. Really? And what would it look like if God said that to you? Yeah, Craig, you're a sinner. God says, I will forgive you. I'm a merciful God. I'm going to forgive you. You've just got to sit in, sit in purgatory until your sins are atoned for. You've just got to go to hell for uh, 10 billion years. Then we'll be good. Slate clean. We'll call it even. And if God did that, it would be mercy. But he didn't. And he doesn't. And he forgives entirely, totally, releasing us. It's not, a, it's not a noble thing for a Christian to say, well, you know, I'm going to forgive my brother seven times. Not noble at all. But Jesus says, as you've been forgiven, so also you must be forgiven. The debt that we owe God is immeasurable. It's immense. It's incalculable. Not only is this debt immeasurable in value, we're talking about pecuniary value here, but it's immeasurable in its corruption. Let me paint your story here. Let's say that one Sunday afternoon after church, you take your family down to the ice cream shop and you're going to give your kids an ice cream. This never happens. Though. I don't know why I'm using this analogy, but let's say you, this happened, right? And as you're doing that, you, you see someone run out of the store. Just a, just a kid, just a 15-year-old kid with an ice cream in his hand. He's run, and the sales clerk comes out screaming, grab that kid. He, he stole that. And you, you grab the kid, you stop him, and the sales clerk says, he didn't, he didn't pay for that ice cream. Well, you could put your hand in your pocket, pull out the money, say, what's it worth? Here's what he owes, and the deal is done. But we understand that's not justice. It might pay for the item that was stolen, but a crime has been committed. So we also ought to think about our sin in this way. It's not only that we're in debt to God, it's that crimes have been committed, and justice demands satisfaction for crimes. Even if we could pay God back for everything we owe Him, we would still suffer the wrath and the penalty that we justly deserve. And this is what the good news of the gospel is. As we ask ourselves, and the question should be, should be prompted, and that is this, how is forgiveness even possible? How is forgiveness even remotely possible? If our debt before God is of infinite value, how could God forgive. Now it's a great story. The parable Jesus told is a great story, but at this point it collapses. It collapses at this point. It's not given to teach the gospel. It's given to teach an obligation that you and I have. Because the reality is in the courtroom of God, before God's bench of divine justice, it's not as simple as God saying, yep, you've sinned, slate is clean, go your way, I'm pretty merciful, remember to speak well about me. That's not what happens at all. But the gospel tells us that God being just and infinite in his justice will have satisfaction for every sin that's ever been committed. Ever. In fact, the Bible says that it would be, it, 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 it would be an indictment on God's judgment, an indictment on God's holiness if he ever acquitted the guilty. And scripture is clear. God will never do so. So Paul tells us in Romans that this is how God is both just and the justifier of the ungodly. That God sends his only begotten son, his one and only son, to this world, sin-free, perfect in holiness. Who obeys the law, lives perfectly, morally, never sinning, and goes to the cross to pay the debt of every single person who will ever trust in him. That's how forgiveness is possible. It's not just as the parable taught, and the parable is absolutely correct. It's Jesus' story. I'm not criticizing at all. It's not just that the king says, all right, debt free, forgiven, write it off, off you go. It's more so, and it's rather that God says, you owe me this. You owe me an infinite satisfaction of justice. But here is my perfect son. And on him will I lay both your sin and the penalty for which it deserves. On Jesus Christ. 
so that I might be just and the justifier. And this is precisely what the gospel teaches us that God does. He gives his one and only son to die the death that we deserve to die. And every day as we amount greater and more sin, we deserve to die 10 billion deaths. Jesus died once for all. And as the scriptures say, he nailed to the cross the indictment that was against us, the, 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 the written code, the requirement, the, the penalty and the debt was nailed to the cross that we might be free. This is how God forgives. So at no point, at no point do we arrive at this prayer, Father, forgive us our sins, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass, at no point do we arrive at that moment and not choke up at this reality. That God is infinitely merciful to forgive us at all. But the way for which he provided forgiveness is absolutely unthinkable, unimaginable. Wonder of wonders it is that Christ the Lord would die on the cross to pay your penalty and debt. And that's the good news of the gospel. And the tragedy is, is that even today, even now, there are people, even here, right now, who don't yet trust in Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? Can you believe they're walking around with this $10 billion of debt on their head? And as I said, it's infinitely more. And there is free salvation in Christ. And they won't be satisfied by it. I'll take my chances. I'll be fine. I'll, I'll face God one day and I'll just, we'll talk it out. Oh, I'm sure I can reason and I can make him see my side of my point of view. God has provided one way, one path, one narrow and straight road to salvation. And it is Jesus Christ alone. Trust him. Trust him now. And be forgiven of all your debt and sin. And remember that those who've been forgiven much, and you've, you've been forgiven, I've been forgiven infinitely more than our puny finite brains could even calculate. Those who've been forgiven much, find joy in releasing others from their obligation to us. That's the fruit. Not the root, that's the fruit of salvation. Those who've been truly regenerate, truly redeemed, truly saved, those who are truly in Christ, find it a joy to forgive others 70 times 7 and more. Why don't we ask God's blessing upon this exposition this morning as we think about what this means for us. And think about what this means for us every time we pray this prayer, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We ask God to reveal to us this morning those people that perhaps we haven't forgiven. We've been been holding this burden. We've been been guarding this bitterness inside of us. We we feel abused. We feel feel justly, uh, justly angry and vengeful. Let us ask God to reveal that to us and help our hearts to find that greatest joy in being like God and forgiving others' sins. So, Father, we come before you today. We ask you, Father, in the name of Christ, your Son, to forgive us our sins. Each and every one of us here this morning have an incalculable debt before you, God, and we have no means to pay it. We are utterly undone before you. We are entirely bankrupt. We are totally depraved. And yet, Father, we see the good news of the gospel is that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, sin-free, perfect, holy, no debt of his own. Yet he pays every last mite that we owe. Every last penny that we owe, he pays. On that cross, lays down his life, endures your wrath, Father, is laid in a tomb and is risen glorious and victorious. We know, Father, we read and we understand that the gospel says that all who trust in Christ, all who trust in Jesus Christ will be forgiven. Will never be required to pay one penny of their debt, but all is laid on the Savior, Jesus Christ, and they are now totally free. And we recognize, Father, that those that have been the recipients of such a message, such a privilege, those that have been recipients of the greatest of all lotteries, if we could be so crass, Father, to use that phrase, 
Those who have been forgiven of their sins are the richest people in the universe. Even though they might not have any money at all. Because they have Christ. So Father, we pray you, you reveal to us today who, who are we holding a grudge against? Who are we refusing to forgive? Who are we failing to pass on this blessing of forgiveness? When we understand, Father, that when we learn and when we realize of our enormous debt and we learn that Jesus died and paid it all, the most natural reaction of the heart is to freely and finally forgive everyone who's ever offended us. But we know every day, every day we fail. So we pray, God, that you give us grace. Give us the courage to forgive others. Give us the strength to forgive others. Some people, Father, have been so badly abused. It takes all their power and they need all the more from you by your Spirit to release them and to look to you, God, and to constantly remember how they have been forgiven. So we do pray for this, Father, that you be glorified in all that we say and do and let us learn our lesson well today as we go out, proclaimers of this great gospel and forgiving those who have sinned against us. In Jesus' name, amen.